So welcome everyone to our um, e-club meeting, the Rotary e-club of District 7710, and I'll pass it over to Kathy to introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Jeanne. It's with great pleasure that I introduce our guest speaker this evening, Rotarian Catherine Smith, author of The Gatekeeper, to the Rotary e-club of District 7710 meeting. The Gatekeeper is the first biography of Misty Lahand, personal secretary to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, Missy Lahand, who worked for Roosevelt for more than 20 years, was with him through his polio fight, helping him establish the Polio Rehab Center at Warm Springs, Georgia in the 1920s. Catherine is a journalist and writer and has spent decades writing for daily newspapers and has been the book columnist for the Anderson Independent Mail for 20 years. She has been involved through Rotary International in Polio Plus, the worldwide effort to eradicate polio, and she has lectured and spoken on FDR's leadership in, the, in that arena. Uh, Catherine is also the author of A Necessary War, an oral history of World War II told by living veterans and civilians. Please join me in welcoming Catherine to our meeting this evening. Catherine? Well, Marguerite Lahand um, was like a, a lot of FDR's advisors. She was very um, discreet and very careful about what she shared about him to others. And in that respect, she didn't keep a diary or write a memoir about the 20 years she spent working for him. She didn't even keep notes, and she was very proud about that. She said she never planned to, to share, um, write a memoir. However, when you don't write your own memoir, um, it means it kind of leaves you wide open for people to write about you and say whatever they want. And that's one of the things that's uh, unfortunately happened to, to Missy. Um, she has been portrayed over time as sort of a, a lovesick secretary or possibly FDR's long-term mistress. And uh, what she really was, was one of the most powerful women in Washington. And uh, for all intents and purposes, FDR's chief of staff. She's the only woman who ever had that role at the White House to this day. You could compare her um, in present days to uh, Valerie Jarrett as a senior advisor to the president and one of his closest friends. Uh, she's Valerie Jarrett has been described as uh, Obama's first friend. And Missy was, was FDR's first friend. Um, she was um, a crucial member of his inner circle and one of the people that made him what we think of as the FDR of history. Marguerite Alice Lahand was born on September 13, 1896 in Potsdam, New York, which is up near the Canadian border. She was um, the granddaughter of what we called a, uh, a coffin ship survivor. He was Irish. Both of her great grand her paternal grandparents were Irish who come over during the potato famine. And they would load these folks up on ships that um, that were ill provisioned and some of them were so ill, so malnourished that they died on the way over and they were just pitched overboard into the Atlantic Ocean. Fortunately, her Lahan grandparents survived the journey and they married in, in Potsdam, they had a child, and then her grandfather was working on a construction project at the Methodist Church. A hatchet fell on his head and killed him. Um, so that was the kind of bad luck her family was, um, was used to having. Her parents, uh, she was the youngest of four children, um, the first were born when her parents were 16. They were more than 40 when she was born, and they moved to a, a blue-collar suburb of Boston called Somerville when she was a little girl. So that's where she grew up, and she always called herself a Boston girl, or she probably said it a Boston girl. She graduated from Somerville High School, the public high school, where she took secretarial courses. Now, one of the clues I got that she had not had a normal childhood was that she was 20 years old when she graduated from high school. And I discovered she had had rheumatic fever, and that meant she probably spent a couple of years in bed um, recovering. It permanently damaged her heart, but it gave her a real um, tie to FDR because she knew what it was like to be put flat on your back um, due to illness. And of course, that's what happened to her. 
Well, she worked in several different um, secretarial jobs after graduating from high school and finally went to work for the Democratic Party in 1920 as the vice presidential campaign secretary. The candidate was one Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was the running mate of James M. Cox, a newspaper publisher from Ohio. Uh, coincidentally, the Republicans had also um, nominated a newspaper publisher from Ohio named Warren G. Harding. Um, his roommate, his running mate was Calvin Coolidge, who was the governor of Massachusetts. Now, Harding looked like a president. He was very handsome. He had a very strong face, these big black arching eyebrows and a silver mane of hair. And that's about where it ended because he was one of the worst presidents in history. If he hadn't died in office, he probably would have made it to the top as the worst president. He was just kind of a, an idiot, really, and was surrounded by a lot of very corrupt people. Um, and it really it just kind of broke his heart when he discovered what had been going on behind his back. Now, Coolidge was, was not one of the corrupt people. He was um, a very honest man, but he felt like a president really shouldn't do very much. He didn't even believe in having a legislative agenda. And fortunately for him, the economy was in good shape, and he went along as president um, for a, a term and, and a, a year. And it was what they call the, the Coolidge Prosperity Years. So meanwhile, Roosevelt had hired Missy as his private secretary after the campaign ended. And they were working together on Wall Street, getting along like a house of fire. And then in August 1921, FDR went to Campobello Island um, off the coast of Maine. It's actually part of Canada. Um, and he came down with poliomyelitis. He was paralyzed uh, below the waist, and he never walked again unaided. He was 39 years old. Um, FDR was not sure he would ever be able to reenter politics. He felt like he had to learn to walk before he could run. And he, he got caught kind of in a pitch battle between his mother, who uh, was a very strong-willed woman, thought that he should just go home and retire to their estate in Hyde Park, New York, and be a country squire. His political advisor, Louis Howe, um, his wife, Eleanor, who thought that he probably had a, pol a future in politics. And finally, he had just kind of had enough of it all. So in the winter of 1923, he rented a houseboat with a friend and spent the winter in the Florida Keys. Um, Missy went along with him as his hostess because Eleanor did not care for that sort of vagabond life and she had five children to look after. Um, FDR felt that he had had so much physical rehabilitation from swimming in the warm waters that he decided to start doing this every winter. So eventually he bought a houseboat called a Laruku and he and Missy in a um, changing cast of characters went down to the Florida Keys every winter from 1924 to 1926 and would spend time on this boat. It was just basically a party boat. Um, now, it, FDR always made out that he was having a wonderful time fishing and swimming and partying and um, just hanging out with his friends, but he was really masking a lot of depression. Missy later said that it was sometimes noon before he could drag himself out of bed and put on a smile and um, greet his guest. That all started to change in 1924. He um, met up an, with an old classmate at the Democratic National Convention, and he told him about a resort he was the part owner of in the little village of Warm Springs, Georgia. It was called Bullockville at the time. And a young man with polio had come there to um, exercise in the waters, and he had eventually been able to walk with just a cane. Now, this was FDR's greatest wish, so he decided to go to Warm Springs, and he and um, Missy, Louie Howe, um, was left at home. Eleanor came with them. Um, and then his uh, FDR's valet, a young black man named Leroy Jones, went to Warm Springs in October 1924. FDR got into the mineral pool there, which was 88 degrees year-round, um, warm, buoyant water because of a high level of magnesium. And he was immediately struck with the way it made his legs feel. He, uh, he said he could feel his toes again. 
a movement in his toes for the first time since he'd had polio. And he determined to stay there for, for several weeks. Um, Eleanor did not like Warm Springs. She um, didn't like the poverty, the racism. Um, she didn't like much about the South. So she did have the five children to look after and a lot of political causes she was involved in. So she got back on the train and went back to New York and left FDR down there in Georgia with Missy and Roy. Um, during the time he was there, he did an interview with a newspaper reporter from Atlanta and said that he planned to swim his way to health um, at Warm Springs. And when he um, <clears throat> um, got back to Warm Springs the following spring after his winter cruise on the La Rocco, um, there were a lot of people with polio waiting for him there. So he and Missy became sort of an, an unlicensed doctor and nurse exercising with these patients in the pool. And he um, began to formulate the idea of creating a permanent rehab facility there. He had a, a hope that he could help fund it by putting, um, uh, attracting people who just wanted to come there for the um, as a resort for just um, for ordinary people and then have the health spa for the polio patients. But the ordinary people were afraid of contagion and didn't want to come there. So eventually he turned Warm Springs into a foundation. It was called the Georgia Warm Springs Foundation and uh, created a nonprofit organization that would support the work there. Um, Things were going along really pretty well um, until 1928 when he was talked into running for governor of New York by Al Smith, who was the Democratic nominee for president. Smith um, had been very successful as the governor of New York for four terms, and he had been nominated for president. Um, actually, FDR had given the nomination speech. Um, but Smith was the first Catholic um, nominee of any political party, and he had a very hard time um, attracting voters for three reasons, all starting with a P. One was the Coolidge prosperity. People thought things were going pretty well with the Republicans in charge. The other was that Al Smith was a wet. He was opposed to prohibition, so you had that P. And the other was prejudice because he was a Catholic. FDR was campaigning for Smith in Georgia, and he actually had a woman tell him that she had heard if Smith was elected, he would nullify all the marriages between Protestants and that all of her children would be named bastards. And this was um, believed widely across the country. So Smith lost his election, but FDR won his by a whisker and was elected governor of New York. Um, he moved to Albany into the governor's mansion, which is it's the same mansion they've got today, but it looked a whole lot worse and it really looked sort of like a horror picture set. And Eleanor invited Missy to move into the governor's mansion with them. Um, she was going to be FDR's private secretary, but, but Eleanor was teaching school in New York three days a week and really didn't want to give it up. So if she had Missy in the mansion, it enabled her to continue her independent life. Um, and Missy would back her up and, and be the hostess when she wasn't there. Um, uh, FDR was was reelected in 1930, and by then the Coolidge prosperity had evaporated. The stock market crashed in um, October 1929. Um, unemployment started ratcheting up, banks were failing, and as governor of New York, FDR made some very um, important moves to help people who had been struck down by the depression, things that the government was not used to having, like a, an emergency relief program and unemployment insurance. Um, things were getting worse and worse, and in 1932, he was nominated for president and took the unprecedented step of flying to the Democratic Convention in Chicago. Uh, that had never happened before. There had never been a candidate who accepted the nomination in person, and he, a candidate had never flown. But it was a very canny thing for FDR to do because it, it showed he was fearless, he was brave, he wasn't afraid of flying. And there had been a lot of, of whispering about what was really wrong with him, um, such as that possibly he had syphilis and that was why he couldn't walk and that it had gone to his head and he would soon be crazy also. Um, 
politics is pretty tough in the 30s. There's, there's not a whole lot that's been done in this, this past election that wasn't tried first on FDR. Um, of course, you know that FDR was deceiving the people about his, his ability to walk also. He worked out a sort of political walk where he would, would, would um, bolt his braces, lock his braces, um, hold on to a cane with one hand and hold on to the arm of another person um, and then kind of hitch his legs along so it looked like he was walking but he could easily fall down and, and then he had all these things most of his pictures were taken with him sitting in a car or sitting behind a desk and he looked very barrel chested and strong from the waist up big shoulders and they just really the American people were pretty much fooled into thinking that he was not that um, disabled, but he actually could not even get out of a chair without help. Well, he was elected by a landslide in 1932, and he went to work um, in the White House the next year. He was inaugurated in March, which was the longest period between um, election and, and um, inauguration. That was the last long interregnum, as that period is called. Um, I've got a piece right now on time.com that talks about the interregnum of FDR and all the terrible things that happened. There was an assassination attempt. Um, most of the 3,000 banks failed. And two days before his inauguration, the um, attorney general designate died on the way to the um, the inauguration. He was an older gentleman. He had just married a much younger Cuban woman, and he had a heart attack on the train. So it's been suggested that he died of a presumption beyond his powers. They didn't know what to do because they didn't have another person in mind for the job, and Missy finally suggested Homer Cummings, who was a well-known Democratic lawyer who was supposed to become the um, governor general of the Philippines, but when he was presented with the options, he was happy to become attorney general and served reliably as FDR's yes, legal, yes man in legal affairs for six years. Um, Missy became sort of the, the queen of the White House staff. She was the only woman in the White House secretariat that ran the West Wing, and it was called a secretariat because the ultimate job title in FDR's White House was secretary. There were three men, Louis Howe, his uh, political advisor, Steve Early, his press secretary, and a man named Marvin McIntyre, who was his appointment secretary, and there was Missy, who did everything else. Uh, she handled FDR's private mail. Uh, she was his liaison between his hospital in Warm Springs. Uh, she was the only person who had a, an office right outside his, and uh, she exercised a tremendous amount of power. Um, Louis Howe was a heavy smoker and was in terrible health by the time he came to the White House and eventually was living in an oxygen tent on the second floor. And as he became weaker and weaker, Missy took on more and more of his responsibilities. So after he died in 1936, she became um, the de facto White House Chief of Staff. Um, Missy, I call her in my book, the Swiss Army Knight, Knife of the White House staff because she was such a formidable, multi-talented, multitasker. But not only was she doing things all day, she was also the White House hostess in, um, whenever Eleanor was, was away, which was a lot of the time because Eleanor traveled constantly. She was known as Rover by the Secret Service. Um, she became recognized throughout Washington for her influence in the White House. She was able to um, bring pe uh, things to FDR's attention that other people needed brought. So they would bring letters to her and, and memos and say, would you bring this up with the president when you feel like he's in a mood to listen? Or um, do you think you might talk to the president about this or such? She also introduced FDR to Tommy Corcoran, who became his White House lobbyist. He was a, a very important person who um, was one of the writers and lobbyists for a lot of the New, New Deal legislation. She was also an important um, influence with Catholic voters who were a major Democratic Party bloc. Um, when FDR was elected in 1932, he carried 82% of the Catholic vote, and that was very important for him to keep that, that uh, group of voters in his um, 
in his corner. Um, Missy lived on the third floor of the White House. She had a cozy suite with a, a bedroom, a sitting room, and a bath. And um, she was considered a very glamorous woman. She had a closet full of evening gowns. She was voted one of the best dressed women in Washington and um, was, was in great demand for speaking, uh, for coming to parties of all kinds. When I went to the home of her great niece, Jane um, Scarborough in Connecticut, she had put all of the invitations Missy had received at the White House on her dining room table. And they were in stacks several inches long, covered the entire surface of the, the table. So it just showed how, how popular and how demand, in demand she was. Missy um, was the liaison between FDR and his polio charity, his foundation at Warm Springs. And she was also the liaison um, with the Marsh of Dimes, which many people have forgotten that FDR founded. So as Rotarians, we care a lot about that. Um, the March of Dimes was um, sort of the fundraising arm for the National Foundation of Infantile Paralysis, which FDR established in 1938. Um, Missy posed for a picture after the first March of Dimes drive that year when thousands and thousands and thousands of envelopes containing dimes poured into the White House. And uh, she was photographed from newspapers holding up a dime and sitting among all these envelopes. But it was uh, the beginning of a really successful uh, campaign for, for polio eradication. Whenever FDR went to, po to Warm Springs, and he went about twice a year, usually in the spring for a week and in the fall for a week, Missy was his hostess. Um, she shared the little White House with him. She had her own bath and private sport porch on the opposite side of his. And it's a tiny little house. Um, I hope some of you have gotten a chance to go to it or will do so when the Rotary Convention is held in Atlanta because it's only about an hour away. Um, Missy was always the, the, the hostess of the little White House. Eleanor would come down for a day or two when FDR was in residence, usually for a you know, have her picture made while he was carving the turkey on Thanksgiving. But she really didn't like Georgia and uh, did not stay there very long. Um, the irony for Missy is that in 1941, when she was 44 years old, she had a major stroke and she wound up as a patient at Warm Springs herself. Um, they did what they could for her for rehabilitation but she had one of those strokes that robbed her of much, of much of her power of speech. So she went back to the White House for a short time in 1942, but um, ultimately she had to be sent home to her family in Massachusetts. And uh, she was, it was really a sad time. She was very lonely. She missed her White House family and all the excitement of working for Roosevelt. Um, he never came to see her, though he did send her um, lovely gifts and called and, and wrote her notes. And he paid for all her medical bills and um, made a provision in his will that um, she would inherit half the income of his estate each year and Eleanor would get the other half just so he would know that her medical bills were being um, covered. She died of another stroke on July 31st, 1944 and her funeral in Boston was attended by 1,200 people, including Eleanor Roosevelt. FDR was on the West Coast making a tour of military installations, uh, so he was not able to come. But he paid for the funeral and provided the words that are engraved on her marker at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. Those words are, she was utterly selfless in her devotion to duty. Um, She's, it's a beautiful cemetery. It's, it's the first garden cemetery in the country full of beautiful statuary. And Marguerite has a, a simple grave marker, but a huge piece of, of pink uh, marble, uncarved marble, is the marker for the Lahan plot. And to this day, the Roosevelt family pays for the upkeep of, of Missy's plot, which I think is, is a very telling thing. Um, I guess that's that's the main part of my talk. What I like to do at this point is just to answer questions.